Welcome to the Intern Whisperer Live, the show all about internships and how to survive them. This is Jerron. This is Isabella. I'm Hunter. I'm Jose. This is Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up this episode of Intern Pursuit Live, Hunter, Kelly, and Jose Contras, founders and owners of Fleur Center Studios, are our employer spotlight. We're going to talk about some great leaders. We're also going to talk about educational games and how it improves memory and learning. Also, the coolest things in innovation. And for our ROTC people out there, we're going to talk about teams and these guys' stories. So, you might want to know how you can find us. You can look for us on our Facebook page, Pivot Biz Consult, on Intern Pursuit. Our Twitter handle is at Pivot Biz Consulting, or at Pivot Biz Consult, sorry at Intern Pursuit, our LinkedIn page, and you can listen to us live on MixLR.com, Valencia College Radio. And our first sponsor is Starter Studio, an accelerator and co-working area. Who will work in co-space to 100-plus companies working in areas of technology and supportive businesses? A healthy startup community doesn't exist in a bubble. And Canvas is working to connect startups to broader entrepreneurial ecosystems that will help them grow. That will help them grow. Their website is canvas.org. Thank you, Canvas. All right. For our first employer spotlight, we're going to talk about Jose Contreras, co-founder of Lucerna Studios. Our first question, what is your role at Lucerna Studios? Ah, we, we talk about this a lot. You know, when, when you're in a startup, you kind of have to wear a lot of hats all the time. And basically, you know, you, you fit whatever you need. And right now, where Lucerna needs me is in a lot of programming and strategic planning and coming up with all these wacky ideas on how to change the world with video games. But uh, I spend most of my day coding, basically, and, you know, debating with Hunter trying to figure out what the best uh, ideas we have in between us. He's really good at cr being really creative and throwing a lot of ideas onto paper, and then we get to, to duke them out and figure out which one wins. Yeah, it's a lot of hunters, uh, pretty convergent, if, if that makes sense. You know, he's just like kind of, uh, well, let me figure out these details, you know, and I'm just throwing ideas out there 24-7, so he's, he's uh, got this barrage of ideas that he always has to kind of figure <laughs> I'm out. I'm always trying to narrow down what Jose is throwing out, like, which, which one are we going to chase, which one works? Yeah. It's a, so, it's guys, I don't think you told them what you do at Lucerna <laughs> Studios. <laughs> right. What is it you sell? Ah, okay, so we make educational video games, and our priority is to kind of close down this gap of parents and kids where kids, you know, love video games, they're so passionate about it, but there's no reason for these parents to be involved in, in the game kind of thing. So, you know, if we make them educational, then everybody gets to play them, everybody gets to have fun, and, you know, parents don't have to feel guilty about these games. And the biggest, the coolest thing is that we're making them in virtual reality, you know, using that uh, immersive multimodal learning that helps kids, uh, you know, from all sorts of uh, learning styles. So I've seen the game, and it's a 3D game, and you have to put the goggles on, and you have to really get into it. But there's a theme. What age group are you targeting here for this game? Be Eight to 13-year-olds right now, the middle schoolers. And what's the name of your game? It's called Medieval Math. So tell our listeners what medieval math is all about. Like, let them paint the picture so they can actually see it. So you are the last defense against the evil empire of Kells. And you have, you have a bunch of arrows, and you have your problem-solving powers. And so you do a lot of math. And you get a bunch of ammo, and you take down a lot of uh, knights and trolls and horse riders and all sorts of things. And hopefully, you know, as you keep going, you power up, you get, you get cooler power-ups. And, you know, the coolest thing for a parent is that every question a kid answers in this game gets tracked to a dashboard so these parents can actually see what's going on, you know, their struggle points of, of the kids and, uh, you know, kind of have actionable items to, to get from that. 
So what you guys may not know over here, Jerron and Andy, is that this I played this game. And so you put the goggles on, and when I was playing it, I was really trying to the multiplication tables. You better really know them because it's moving <laughs> super fast. It's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, we'll my gosh, the pressure. problems are flying right mm -hmm. at me. I feel like the problems are there, and then I've got these little spears and arrows, and I'm trying to shoot the, the knights, and I'm going, wait, how, what am I supposed to do? I'm trying to figure this out. And the kids are way smarter at it than myself. And I know that they took this game over there to some elementary schools and also I, to a middle school. Did you guys go to a middle school too? Yeah, yeah we've been we to yeah. I think everything but high school. I bet the high schoolers would still like it because it's we yeah, had it's still a thirteen-year-old tell us it. The older kids would still like it as well. We thought we kind of assumed that thirteen is our oldest. Like the, the yeah, cap of just the age. because of the art, you think? It's just starting to mature at that point. You know, mm -hmm. maybe some learning game isn't what they expect, but. Uh, you know, we're still talking to these kids and figuring out what they want, and th they love it right now. Mm -hmm. Also on the educational side, you know, to really address the problems of high schoolers, it's kind of a lot harder, you know. It is. Yeah. I used to teach high school, so I know that. Yeah. That's very true. So um, my next question over here is, when you're playing this game, how do the students know when they've beaten the game? How, what's, what's the victory? Well, so, there's ahead. not really a victory right now. The, the way the game is, it's to be played repetitively, mm -hmm. and you do math, and you just see how far you can get in. We're really weaving in the competitive element for these kids. Uh, a lot of kids have told us that they love to compete with their friends and end up on the top and, and be the best, um, and we're adding in elements that you can customize your castle, your avatar to keep this game going. Um, but right now, there's no clear win point because you're just trying to defend the castle perpetually it's basically one of those wave based survival games mm. so you're just trying to survive as many waves as you can you know the the, the biggest part is that we want to make sure that this game is replayable so that you know a kid's not going to play it for a couple weeks and then and then you know Get let bored. go of it yeah mm -hmm. yeah so you know a big part is making sure you know you can go as far as you want you know if you keep if you keep getting better at math and you keep you know getting good accuracy then you can go so at the end of the game, when they're finished playing, do they get some kind of a thing that pops up and says you're the master math ma mathematician or something? Something like that. We, we let the, the player know how they did, how many questions they got right, how many nights they got, their accuracy. We give them some statistical feedback. We're going to be putting in a currency in the game. So after that, these matches that they play, they can go upgrade their castle, their character, make, customize them, and, and really get into this game. That sounds good. So, Jerron and Andy, did you guys go to Otronicon by chance? Well, these guys were there at Otronicon, so I don't know if you actually got to see them or not. Were you guys there on Monday? I did not go to Otronicon. Okay. So we were, we were there on Monday on the fourth floor. We only got to go for one day, but we had a ton of fun. A bunch of kids and parents played the game, and uh, there was a couple of kids that just kept coming back, I think, three or four times with their <laughs> parents. Just, oh, come on, we, I just want to play one more time, and... And, you know, they, we'd always ask them, like, what do you think about the math in the game? Because that's, you know, the math's probably the, not the fun, most fun part about our game. But they didn't even notice it. You know, they just, it's just something that they had to do to keep playing the game. And that's kind of, I think, what we're, we try to create in this stuff, that the learning is just something that's, that's there. It's, it's still really important, but it's not something that catches them off guard. Like, it doesn't break that immersion that the game is creating for them. Mm. And um, what was your inspiration for you guys to make these kinds of games? Oh man, there's there's a whole bunch of uh, we can start from really early on uh, of us just kind of playing games a whole bunch and just knowing that video games uh, are are such a strong learning medium that you can you know learn so much from it. For this game specifically, I know that there's a, there's a mode that inspired me a lot of uh, in uh, it's called Dead and Buried, which is mm. a VR game that uh, you know on the Oculus you basically shoot a bunch of dudes coming at you. It's kind of like this cowboy western style, and you have this fence in front of you, and the, the more they hit the fence, uh, you know, they, they can kind of take over your, your place, and then, you, you know, you dead. You, mm -hmm. uh, you dead and buried, I guess, <laughs> like the, game, the game's called. Yeah, there's, there's really not a lot of good VR content out there, I think, right now. I think it's still a really unexplored medium. So Dead and Buried was a really good reference for us as a game because it's kind of like a tower defense game, Mm -hmm. But you're the tower in VR because it's sometimes it can be disorientating to move, and they they had a really clever solution on how to you just lean and dodge, and you have this like little barrier around you that you need to finish or like keep repaired. Mm -hmm. A really good reference point for our game. Yeah, I I play a lot of uh, Clash Royale 
I don't know if you guys ever heard of that game. That Clash game, of Clans. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's Same kinda, people make it. Yeah. I think I see the commercials every time. Like, <laughs> the Super, during the Super Bowl especially. Right. I always see an ad. It's a random YouTube <laughs> ad. Just, right. <laughs> yep, yep. They like that. Yeah, so so in terms of the art style and the and the and just the, the feel of it, mm-hmm. you know, we're very inspired by that. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm always, I'm always, anytime somebody's working on the game, I'm like, you got to download this game. You got to play it. Get the feel, the whimsicalness of it, you know, the sounds. I, I love that game. It's, it's too addicting. <laughs> very, very fun. <laughs> So what what would you want parents to know about this game? Is that we're making it for them, mm-hmm. really. I mean, at its core. Um, one of the things we learned at Starter Studio and Canvas is that when we start a business, we need, to make, uh, we need to go and figure out what our customers would pay for and what they want in a product and then make that for them. I mean, I really want these parents to know that it is a game, but it's a, ga- it's a game that benefits them and their kid. And mm-hmm. it's... It's not something that, you know, there's always this adage I hear all the time, like, oh, you're just wasting your time playing video games. Like, well, how about I meet you halfway? Like, these kids are always going to be playing video games. They're going to be in front of a screen from the moment they're born these days. Like, why don't I make their screen time educational for you and for them? Like, you get to learn and see how they're doing and engage in their hobbies, and then the kid gets to just play the things they're passionate about. I mean, that's, like, the one message I want to get across to, to, the, to my listeners and stuff today. Yeah, we've, we've interviewed a whole bunch of parents, a whole bunch of teachers, and, you know, we really kind of map out these pains from these people and, and these emotions they're feeling. And, and you know, hopefully they, they see it in the game that this isn't just some tr- thing we're trying to, you know, swindle people. We're, we're trying to make something that's a really valuable tool and a really valuable, not, not just functional, but also emotional tool for these parents to be able to connect uh, with their kids and all that. And what about the teachers? What feedback have you gotten from the teachers? The, the teachers is a really interesting customer segment. Um, they have no time, and they're really stressed in their job. So, you know, if we make a game for a teacher, it, it has to be easy for them to implement. Um, it has to match up with their learning management systems and provide the, the data that's important for them to make decisions on their, their students' performance. The teachers are all for this game. You know, if, any, if they have a tool that can engage their kids when they're learning, that's a win for them. And, uh, you know, what I tell my teachers is, like, hey, we're, we're making a game for you, too. It's just going to take a little bit longer because uh, selling to schools is – has a lot more steps into selling to, to parents. Yeah, we so we started when when we were in Starter Studio, uh, we were you know figuring, oh yeah, we're gonna th- fix the public education system. We're gonna go <laughs> in there and you know just go fix it all up. It's gonna be awesome. Can't wait. And um, we realized that you know we have this kind of term where where there's a sh- shallow end of the pool and the deep end of the pool. And and when you have a startup, you want to start with your market in the shallow end. You know so. Uh, basically, the, who are your early adopters? Who are the easy people that you can start selling to? And we realize that you know public school systems aren't the easiest to sell to. So we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there once we have some. You know, we establish ourselves and our, we have a lot of games and all that. Then we're gonna you know help these mm-hmm. teachers. We're gonna save save the world a little bit. So what was the jumping off point for you guys to decide to make your studio? Was there like a specific moment where you felt like what you had envisioned in your mind was needed? I think well, this guy can answer that. Yeah, so Hunter and I met in uh, in uh, in college. Uh, we've known each other now for ten years, and we've always had this thing where you know people are like, "We want to make a company. We we just want to make something, create something." Because we we really we ran a lot of organizations in college, and uh, you know we would we would work with people, and and we basically always say. We don't care what we make. We just want to make a, an organization that's really cool to work for and that has a positive impact. So that there's always been that kind of tingling, you know, in, inside of us to make something awesome. And then after college, I went to work at a game studio here, a big game studio here in Orlando. And after four years, you know, I got got kind of tired of being a little cog and I wanted to, you know, make a make make something on my own. And so I called. This guy and I said, "All right, man, let's let's do something. Let's make a game studio." And originally, we were going to go to Vietnam to make it. And that's a <laughs> yeah. That was the crazy thing when I, I when I moved down here, we were going to spend you know roughly three months. We were waiting on some citizenship paper for Jose to go through, and then we were going to just jet on out to Vietnam, where our money is a lot can take us a lot further than it can here. But mm. when, when I got here and we started making the rounds to the meetups and started networking a lot, you know, you realize you can't leave this ecosystem when you're inside of it. No. There's so many good things that, are, that can help you. And, you know, uh, there was some podcast I listened to on some flight to D.C. And in it, it the, the guy they were interviewing just said, like, 
you know, this, the key to success is luck, but he, he thinks, he says it's more than that. It's like recognizing when you are lucky and taking advantage of that. And that was something that kind of stick, stuck with me when I first got here. Like, we're meeting all these people that are connected, that can, that can help us, that can mentor us, that can, you know, guide us through our failures quickly. And that was just undialable. Like, we couldn't leave then. And I think that's when we realized that we had to at least chase it here in Orlando for the time being. Yeah, we kind of just kind of stumbled upon these awesome opportunities and decided that we should, you know, really take the best of it. Yeah. So it's called the Intern Whisperer. So we're going to switch gears and talk about internships. Cool. Have either of you guys ever been an intern? I haven't. Yeah, I, I, I was an intern for that company, that big game studio here, uh, for quite some time. That's, that's basically how I started. They just flew me over here. And I got I got I got to do the internship twice basically, which was really cool. <laughs> you know, I did it I, I did it once, and then I actually had a few more uh, classes to finish up, so I couldn't actually get the job. But they wanted me to be there. Uh, but yeah, overall the experience is pretty pretty awesome. I these guys treat you well. They'll send you to Disney and all that, and you know you're this college kid, so you're just like, wow, this is so awesome. Perks everywhere, and uh, they they treat you. You know, they they give you enough. Uh, money to have a nice apartment and all that so that was that was really cool and when I got to the this this uh this place I actually didn't know how to do the things I was supposed to know because I kind of you know (laughs) I was like yeah 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 I know that stuff you know I know about video games back then I I loved film and I wanted to go to Pixar and that kind of stuff so I was I was really passionate about going to film but I kind of realized that games were kind of the new the film, if that makes sense, you know, the new way of telling a story. So I jumped into this, but, you know, when I got there, they'd be like, all right, you know, build the game and then, you know, let us know when you're done with that and, and we'll give you some tasks. And I'm like, yeah, sounds good. And then he leaves and I'm just like, I don't know what building a game means. Was, was there some button or something? So I'm like <laughs> Googling it, trying to figure it out, you know. Uh, but it, it's cool because I, I think when you're starting out, you're you're so humble about everything that you can quickly pick up things and just like adapt to an environment you know you don't have all this baggage of like oh yeah i know how things are supposed to be run Mm -hmm. so you know after the first month i was a regular there and uh i also realized taught me a lot about working quickly and not all the time versus you know in, in school i would be like oh I I worked for 36 hours straight. I'm so good at what I do. Oh my gosh. And you know, they don't really appreciate that in in bigger companies and when you're, you know, you're an, an intern, you're trying to impress, you're trying to work all the time and they're like, "Go home. Take a break." And and that was really hard for me to figure out, you know, after a while I'm, I I figured out, okay, you want to work as hard as you can for these 8 hours and then not think about it. That way the next day when you get there, you can work as hard Fresh, as you can. Fresh, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So That was a big difference between school and the professional world. So it doesn't sound like there was much of a training program, or was there a training program? Did you get onboarded? How did you, like, nobody was there to say, here, this is what you're supposed to do, and... No, they they just throw you in there. Uh, You know, I guess they they try to get bright people, and they just kind of... Put you put you there and and problem solvers. Yes, a lot of a lot of problem solving. I mean, it you know you you have the tools. It, kind of what what you learn in school, or for for me, what I learned in school was kind of more complicated than than what I was doing in the in the in the company. So it wasn't it wasn't as hard to do. It was more uh, just learning the ropes, the habits of people, and all that. And but yeah, yeah, they they just throw you in there. They don't really, uh, they, you know, they have one day, first day. They're like, here's the cereal bar, and here's uh, the PowerPoint presentation. But uh, the, you know, you, you got a lead, so the lead kind of guides you through things if you have have some questions and all that. Well, that's good. That could have been a little bit like, oh my God, what do I do now? Like, where am I supposed to save this? How am I supposed to save it? What am I supposed to do? Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's a good time for experimentation, seeing how things go, just like you could go here, you could go that way and see what your boss thinks or your lead, I guess. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess it's just not just one way to do something. Did you ever build the game wrong? Oh, yeah, you mess things up all the time. Um, but, you know, you keep it local and you just erase and don't tell anybody and then start over. But uh, <laughs> I, it's... it's uh, it, it, the first the first couple months are really slow because you're you're installing everything and you're understanding how everything goes. So there's there's a really long ramp up. There's not a training program, but just the nature of how the job is. You kind of just 
Well, it has to work better because you're working in weekly sprints, I assume. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like, oh, it takes three months to get this game done. No, you have to work on it every week, and they're guiding you along that process, it sounds like. Definitely. definitely. Yeah. yeah. So you guys got to work with an intern, one of my interns. Tell us about that experience. What were the lessons learned, and how did it go? Yeah, there's a lot of lessons in there, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of the lessons uh, were learned by the two of us, more so than our intern. Um, when we got your intern, I don't think we were ready to have an intern. I mean, and, and a lot of, in a lot of ways, uh, you talked about an onboarding process earlier. Right. We didn't have that. We, we didn't know what that was. And we were probably in the middle of Starter Studio not prepared to do that, to offer that, that, um, that ramp up to him. He's a great guy, great fit, you know, ready to work, which is perfect. I just don't think we were ready to shift the time we were committing to something else to him. And that's a really important lesson to learn. Like, even if you get a new employee, a new co-founder, an intern, like, they take a ramp up and an onboarding time frame to get to where you want them to be. And, uh, you know, managing your expectations and the reality of what they bring are, are a, it can be a challenge, that's for sure. Yeah, expectations. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key word because if you come in, anybody comes in with expectations – and that person doesn't meet them, then there's a tendency to think it's the other person's fault instead of being reflective and going, well, what is it that we could have done to make it a better experience for both of us, mm -hmm. right? Because there's this place where everybody that is on the side of business, they need to realize that they have a responsibility to be able to make that a good experience, just like in the customer discovery process, right? We want our customers, our users, to be able to have a good experience, buy the product, love it, tell others to buy it. And it's the same thing with anybody that works in our company. We want them, including interns, to have a good experience. But it's really important to have the process in place. So it was interesting to hear your perspective, <laughs> yeah, definitely, yeah. and then the other. So just as a little side note, that student came back, with, uh, came back to work with me, and he was able to do quite a bit uh, also. But I had more experience doing that than you guys did. Mm. That's for sure. And so that's why it was, it was different. He was a four-credit student. He was doing it because this counts as an elective. He paid mm. money. And... I had told him it takes a lot to to lose your internship, but you know he came back over here on my side, and he did really well. I was really proud of him of how he finished, and so it was something that it was good for me because I got to learn also to make sure that I'm preparing employers for that process of bringing talent in. So it was it was good for me in yeah. that sense too. I, I think that one of the big biggest things I've learned in general about the startup world. Is that is a concept of exchanging value over just this idea that cash is the only kind of value, you mm -hmm. know? Because at first, you know, I think, oh yeah, if we could have a couple free interns while we start, then you know we can get rolling. But uh, you know, nothing's truly free, and and the value that you give back to this person is is you know giving them real world experience and training them and and developing them into somebody that can work, at, uh, you know. Uh, productively and, and well in the team and and it's it it's it's something that you're giving back which means that it's something that takes time and effort you know it's not mm -hmm. something free you can't just be like oh yeah I got this thing it's for free and then you don't do anything <laughs> about it kind of thing There's that is so true yeah that was something that I think kind of bummed me out is like you know we're good leaders we have lots of experience with that developing individuals but we didn't have the time to develop this intern like we wanted to and it was that was like a Something that was hard to accept at the time for me because it's like I just want to do everything, you know. I don't want to mm -hmm. take no for an answer, but I really just didn't have the time to train an intern and, you know, those expectations I, I spoke about earlier. Yeah, and I think part of it is the um, program that we were in at Starter Studio. It yeah. was really intense, mm -hmm. so it didn't allow us the luxury to be able to say, "Oh, let me give you some time." Whereas now I think that things are way laid back for you. So you'd be able to accommodate that now. It's, a, it's better timing for you. Less demands on us. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, Jerron, you want to ask him some of our other questions so I'm not totally monopolizing the microphone here? <laughs> of course. All right, Jose. Um, three leaders, living or dead, on a global level, local level, and personal level, that you think is extraordinary. Hmm, Okay. So I read this biography on uh, Julius Caesar, and that guy was pretty cool. He's a 
he just had this natural ability of of ha- of being a leader of of just placing himself in a place where it, it, people told him people would just would just say that when you were around him he could just he could just kind of tell you to do things and and the, his character and the way he 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 stood was was enough you know and i think that's that's a really important thing in leadership where you have to kind of be a beacon for people you know whether you know what you're supposed to do or not you need to pick a direction and you need to you know stand tall and that that's really cool i mean julius caesar if you i mean the stuff he did he was he was crazy he was <laughs> he was a uh, you know he was a leader for the people and you know he, he obviously rome kind of gets a little sketchy sometimes but in general for that time he was he was a pretty great guy um Let's see. Local? Oh, um, one question I have yeah. to ask for both of you. Yeah. Um, what kind of leaders do you see yourselves being? Oh, cool. Mm. They didn't finish the other one, though, yet. I know, but... You're I'm jumping like, around. Okay, know. gotcha. No, Only because cool. he was saying how that, like how Julius Caesar was. I was kind of curious. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say, like, Humble's probably pretty high up there nowadays. I mean, that's something that we, we strove for in, in college, to be, like, servant leaders is what they taught us, um, to be humble as well, uh, is uh, sometimes uh, some of the leaders we've encountered have a really big ego that mm-hmm. makes you not want to follow them or deal with them a lot. And so those those they can be really abrasive leaders. You know, they might be doing really good things, but they might be making some of the people that are part of their cause or organization like not. You know, there's a lot of friction created, and so like not as much momentum is created by this leader because you know people are pissed off at him or they don't buy into the vision overall because they don't like what he's saying or they don't like him as a person. So I think I'm, we're always trying to be like down with. You know, I, I don't want to use like structured terms, but like you know, with the with the guys, I guess you know, like just because we have these titles that start with C or anything, doesn't mean that we're any different than the people who have to do the work that we ask them to do. Mm. Yeah, I think for me, a, a big thing is kind of almost on the opposite side of this whole being a beacon and, and mm-hmm. you know showing direction is is like what you're saying. I, I think of it as listening. You know, the the leader is the person that most has to be listening to everybody else all the time because. Uh, you know, you don't know what's going on in these people's brains, and you're supposed to be motivating them. And if you're not following these people's emotions and their cues and the cues of the overall organization, if you're just there in your ego, just kind of listening to yourself and in your mind's echo chamber, then it's not going to go well. You have to just, you know, listen as hard as you can. Whenever somebody, whenever something upsets you, whenever you feel like you're going to take something personally, you just have to make sure that you understand what is actually going on because if you don't understand uh, you know you have you have one of the best perspectives uh, you know you're you're going to have a hard time yeah i agree all right and now back to the local <laughs> level <laughs> uh see local you, you you got you got a good one local here yeah yeah i would say um there's this company in, in starter studio called streamfluence mm-hmm. Can I say their people's names on here? Oh, we can inside a starter. Yeah, okay. They're, they'll be coming on the show. too. Well, his name's Colt. He's yeah. a good local leader for me. He's a peer, pretty much same age and stuff. But he, he's a, uh, I think he's got a really solid head on him for business, for where he's taking his business, the type of work that he's doing. And it, um, I know I can always ask this guy a question, say about funding, for example, and he could just break it down for you. You know, talk to you as if it's easy. And hard at the same time to do, but yet it's still accomplishable. And uh, to me, I, you know, he, he's a great uh, ear that I, I pull on from time to time for for wisdom and advice on what we should do. And um, that'd be my local leader. I mean, there's a couple others, but I think that's probably the one that I interact with the most. I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How about on a personal level, Jose? For me, it's definitely my mom. She's just. She has this uh, ability to just always be young and be really kind of uh, childlike in a way, innocent. And I really try, I think that I'm like that because she influenced me. She let me be kind of a kid and we just kind of be, be kids together. I mean, <laughs> I, I remember one time, she, you know, she's kind of an older lady. Uh, I think she's like 16 now maybe, Uh when, one time we, were, I'm like, mom, let's go play basketball. Let's, let's go outside a little bit. So, so you know, and, and this is uh, we're like older. I was like 18 or something like that. And uh, so we're walking to the basketball court, and and I like the ball falls or whatever, and it's just rolling. And I'm like, mom, kick it, kick it. And she just like runs to the ball and tries to step on it, and just like 
eats it it just falls really badly oh but <laughs> she was okay but she you know just like this this older lady to just be chasing after a ball and she's like really excited about it uh i, I don't know I, I hope that i'm i'm like that at that age i can just be a kid that's cool yeah so are you turning it over to uh hunter oh of course okay only because um i had already asked about your global and you said local what is your global leader that's a tough one i you know, I kind of want to take the easy cop out and say Elon, just because I'm in this in entrepreneurial ecosystem, and he's like revolutionizing like space travel mm -hmm. and planetary travel with tubes under the ground going <laughs> 800 miles an hour. But I, I don't know; it's a hard one to say on a on a global level that I'm really that really impacts me from day to day. I'd have to say it's him right now, but maybe it's just because in the ecosystem I live in. Um, I'm not sure. That's that's probably who I would say right now. All right. If you put me on the spot. And on a personal? There's this guy in college. His name's Captain Humphreys. No one will know him about Jose in this room, but he was, <laughs> he was really inspirational to us. He, there was uh, some hard times for us when we were sophomores. In this. We were in an ROTC program, and you know, when you know there's a bad leader above you and you have to deal with them and you hate it you know, and, and you feel like you have any shred of power, like, you'll probably act on it. And I know we were. And we were causing just a lot of friction in our peer group, in our upperclassmen, and I'm sure it was bleeding into our underclassmen too. But this guy came in, told us to get back to work, really frustrated me. You know, I was like, this guy doesn't see it, you know. I believe in this guy. What's up? He's, he, he doesn't see the issue. He's telling me to, to let it go. Well, it turns out he went and talked to our, our biggest boss in our chain of command and told him there was these huge underlying issues and really stepped in as a leader from the outside of our organization and just uh, was always there for us. It was, it was a, you know, a, a springboard for ideas and just taught us, like, you know, we, uh, we don't think we had too many good examples in the core for leadership mm. uh, during certain phases of the program, but this guy was always there, solid as a rock, you know. And I'm sure if now if I went to him for advice, he'd, he'd be able to help me out as well. So mm. Captain Humphreys, you know, my local leader or my mm. personal leader. <laughs> And um, another question, going off script. Um, what do you think is the most valuable lesson you guys learned from being at ROTC? Or is there one that specifically that kind of sticks with you? For me, it was the, the amount of discipline I can create for myself. Uh, just, you know, I, I can't do half of those things I used to be able to do. Just even stand at attention and, and you know, leave your hand uh, the saluting for 15, 20 minutes or whatever. Uh, just, just that, I guess that discipline is something that you build, that it's not just something you have or don't. It's like a muscle. You just kind of slowly work at it. And, and you know, from in one day, you're not going to be like, okay, I'm going to, you know, stop that. I'm going to kick that habit or I'm going to, uh, you know, do a thousand push-ups every day. You just got to, you just got to build into that kind of thing, which is really important. Oh, yeah, for sure. I'd say... You know, the lesson I took away that I'm that we talk about quite often is like, uh, I guess, just dealing with challenges in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the ROTC program we're a part of from the moment you start is awful. You know, everyone's yelling at you. It's fast paced. You don't know anything. It's designed for you to fail hundreds of times throughout a whole year. And um, it's been really helpful when we started this business because, you know, I live on a budget, you know. The life I had before this was probably way more comfortable than I'm living now, but that, none of that even matters because I know what I was able to achieve and push myself through back then. It's like, oh, this is easy. I have AC and no one's yelling at me in the morning to wake up. Like, okay, you know, I can do it. And I, I, maybe the, the lesson is just like just overcoming adversity and challenges, like even when they seem like all in your life and you just can't escape them, like dealing with that anxiety and that stress. Very cool. That's a good answer, too. Yeah, it just puts things into yeah. perspective in life. You know, like, yeah. when I think my life's hard, I can always be like, well, at least I'm not having some guys yelling at me while I'm doing push-ups in the mud and rain at 5 a.m. in the morning. Just put on your back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or, or, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You had mentioned um, that you felt that the ROTC program really um, helped develop a servant leadership model. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting because that's near and dear to my heart. It's something that I always want to exhibit to others is that we're really here as leaders we're here to serve those in our organization we're here to serve our clients some people think that that concept has a um, maybe a negative meaning because of whatever the 
definition of servant means in their head, but really, to me, it's the, the ultimate um, of how a leader can guide people to be more than what they ever expect that they can be. Oh, yeah. There's a... Do you remember his name? The Marine Corps... Emerson? Yeah, Major Colonel Emerson. yeah, Major Emerson, Colonel Colonel Emerson. He used to keep a a journal of his of his cuz he was a real marine officer, so he would keep in a journal of all his enlisted people where they lived, their wife's names, their kids names. So he knew these people. And like and then, you know, at that way like, you know, you're ordering these people around day to day and it can be kind of tense, but if you know these people, it it just gives that extra layer of connection. You know, that's a I think that's a small example of what it means to be a servant leadership. Like you go out and get to know your peers, your your subordinates and you understand the decision that you make for them because you you know who they are, and that's I think that's really powerful, you know, especially in a business. If I tell you to go do this little menial task for forty days in a row, like that'll wear on you. But hopefully, like I know you, and like we have a relationship where you understand that, like I'm here to serve you, but at the same time, like there's always this give and take. Mm -hmm. And creating that servant leadership is like a I think it's a really fluid thing and hard to, to balance, but it's it's what we strive for. Did he explain to you why that menial task has a something that will resonate and ripple throughout the either throughout your own personal um, work ethic, but also how it impacts everything else around you? For example, cleaning the toilets. Nobody wants to do that, but yet we need clean toilets, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say the court is not the best at doing that <laughs> explaining but, the little why yeah. you're doing all this stuff. yeah you you understand the traditions as after you do them a bunch but uh the the good leaders do that for yeah. sure and that's that's what i think when you're in a when a when you're in an environment like that like a military environment for example or a real high ten, high intensity environment just giving the why is always helpful and just goes a long way mm -hmm. i to go to the servant leadership question i so I, I have this idea of org charts, or organizational charts, that is kind of different, where instead of, you know, this the CEO and stuff are on top, and then it trickles down to the lowly developers and marketers or whatever, I always see it as, as almost like an organism, right? Where the, the, the leadership is kind of in the center, right? And basically, the people that are further out are the people that are actually connected with the situation, with, you know, the, the developers are connected with the game kind of thing. So the people, the people that are on the outside know what's going on, and the people that are on the inside don't, right? The leaders are in the middle, and they see a big picture, but they don't actually touch the consumer, touch the end user. So they don't know anything. Like, as a leader, you don't really know anything until people come and tell it to you. So your, your job is only to help these people by gathering all this information and making decisions. But you're not, you're not commanding these people. You're not doing anybody a favor. You're just, you're just grabbing all their, all their information and trying to coordinate and make, make the best decision. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Well, sadly, this has been a really good show, but we're like at the end of time. We've oh, just gone has. and okay. run right, up, right on through Are there any key questions that need to get asked before so we go? So I want to say thank you to Valencia College for letting us have our show here. I want to thank Hunter and Jose for being guests on the show. You're going to be able to see this all going out in the social feeds. Um, we're supposed to thank some other people, I think, but I'm turning it over to you, Jerron. Of course. Our second sponsor, real quick, is BMDM Marketing Agency. B BMDM is a direct marketing agency focused on helping companies reach individuals through online and offline means. Their newest product enables them to send postcards or letters to the homes of anonymous website visitors within 24 hours of their visit using a patented IP matching technology and our in-house on-demand printing. Thank you, BMDM Marketing Agency. But before we head out, any shout-outs? Uh, Canvas, Starter Studio, uh, Isabella for inviting us on here. Oh, yeah, thank, <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, you Isabella. guys for, for bringing us in. All right, no problem. I mean, if you ever get to know <laughs> Isabella, she's one of the most helpful people that you will ever meet around here. Uh, and she knows everybody. Everybody knows yeah, her. I don't does. know. I don't know what's going on there, but she she will she will gladly help you out in whatever you're, you know you need i think i don't know you gotta ask her but she's, she's about it <laughs> thank you guys all right so thank you for being uh, listening to the intern whisperer and stay tuned for us for next week mm -hmm.